This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. All right, so uh, welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Harold McGee, who is um, probably one of the, you know, food science is, is that even a, I don't even know if that's a distinct discipline because you're not in an, in, in an academic, you don't have an academic affiliation, but I think, I think of you as kind of the world's leading uh, food scientist, maybe along with uh, Ferran Adria, and, you know, a couple other practitioners. Um, but, uh, but, you know, Harold is also the author of most recently this book, uh, Nose Dive, um, a field guide to the world's smells, which is you know, kind of awesome. It, and it builds, it sort of works from the, uh, builds on this book, which is kind of the, the Bible for a lot of us who are interested in food science on, on food and cooking. This is the, um, second edition. Uh, I had, I bought the first edition back in the eighties. This is the latest edition. Uh, and he's also the author of the curious cook. And, um, the other book, which I can't remember is the, the, the tip keys to good cooking. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Welcome Harold. Thank you, Greg. It's great to be with you. Now, before we jump in and start talking about the, the nosedive book, um, you know, your background is one that is fascinating to me because, you know, you, you, you started at Caltech and, uh, and then I think you were studying chemistry and then you wound up at uh, Yale doing English lit. That's the, that's not the normal trajectory. Um, you know, I, I, st I studied at Caltech. Uh, I, I lasted, you know, I didn't last as long as you did. I realized that I, I needed to, to switch out. Um, I could not, could not stomach it for very long. Um, but, but, you know, what, what made you decide to, um, switch to the humanities, um, when, when you were, you know, basically studying to become a scientist? Well, I, I started out, uh, thinking that I was going to be an astronomer, uh, and my father had gone to, uh, to Caltech. And so on our coffee table, as I was growing up, we would have the alumni magazines and of course, Mont Palomar belonged to, uh, uh, Caltech and, and Mount Wilson and so on. So anyway, it was the obvious place to, to shoot for. And I was, uh, I, I squeaked in, um, and got there and kind of had the same experience you did, which is that, um, I, I discovered that, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of astronomy was not really what I was interested in. Um, but there were people there who, uh, who kind of took me under their wing and said, you know, you came here because you're interested in science. You can, if you play your cards, right, cherry pick the courses you take here and, um, and stick around. And so I ended up majoring, I got a bachelor of science degree in literature <laughs> from Caltech. Wow. I didn't even know they had that. Yeah. Well, I didn't either until, uh, until they told me <laughs> that was a possibility. And it really was ideal because I was able to study literature and philosophy most of the time, but then, you know, take a course from Willie Fowler who helped, uh, discover how it is that the elements are created in stars, you know, heard it from, from him himself. That was uh, an amazing experience. So I, I, um, you know, I, I realized I was interested not so much in the nuts and bolts as in the, the feelings and ideas that astronomy elicited in me. And so that's why I went into literature and then went to Yale and studied, um, poetry, English romantic poetry in particular. And I was ready to spend the rest of my life immersed in that. Uh, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of jobs for people to teach English romantic poetry at the level I wanted to do it. And so I did it for a few years, kind of, uh, one year at a time, couldn't really land, a a permanent position. And so I began to look around for other things to do. And that's how I ended up eventually writing about, uh, the science of cooking. <laughs> yeah. I started in, in French history and, and made a detour. Um, but, um, in that, in, in the book, at the end of the book on smells, you, you recount, uh, what it was like to be in the library all the time. I see you have kind of a bit of a library behind you, but, but you, you made me when you, just that passage made me evoked in me this, 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 uh, this remembrance of the smell of, of bookstores and the smell of, of the library, which is a smell I think that is, um, ultimately, you know, one that, that our, our descendants will, 
will never be exposed to, right? It's a, and, and, uh, but, but what I found interesting is just the, the writing about it and, and the talking about it was sufficient to evoke, uh, a, a smell memory. And, uh, you know, the memory of smells is so, so deep inside of us. And oh, I think we'll get, we're going to get into that. Uh, but you know, the other thing I wanted to ask you initially is, you know, in this book, you, you, you have it in the introduction, um, say that when the first edition came out in 1984, there really wasn't any kind of defined discipline of, of food science. Now, I think maybe some of the folks at Davis would, would, would disagree. Um, you know, maybe they, they think that the agricultural science is the same as, as, as food science, but, uh, or taste science, uh, what, what's happened over the last, uh, you know, 30 years almost, um, how has this discipline emerged? Uh, how has it evolved and, and what, you know, are, are you surprised by this? Well, I should say that, um, there, there is a discipline called food science, uh, an academic discipline, uh, in which you can get, you know, a master's and a PhD and that kind of thing. It's been around for not that long, actually, you know, uh, decades, not centuries. Um, but, uh, what, and, and so what I did was kind of stumble on the fact that this field existed, which was, you know, unapparent to um, almost everyone back in the seventies, it was a, a backwater. And, um, when I stumbled on it and realized that there was so much interesting stuff in there, uh, I mean, that's, that's really what motivated me to, to do the writing I did. And so I would call what I do, uh, kitchen science. So it's, uh, you know, food science as an academic discipline is, is largely devoted to manufacturing and, um, you know, pu public, uh, safety, public health issues, that kind of thing. Um, not so much about what happens in people's kitchens or in restaurants even. And so that's what I wanted to do was translate that academic field, uh, to the everyday, uh, world of cooking. And, uh, it's true that in the 1970s, that was a new idea. There were a couple of other books actually that came out around the time that I thought about this. Um, but one was, uh, a kind of question and answer book. So if you didn't uh, ask the right question, you wouldn't find the answer. <laughs> and the other was, um, actually written by a professional chemist who, who knew his chemistry, but really, uh, didn't have, uh, clearly had a dim view of the, um, capacities of his readership. So it was kind of a dumbed down version of, uh, of chemistry. So, uh, what I really wanted to do was write for people like myself and my friends for the most part. I didn't really know anyone in the restaurant industry at that time. I just wanted to, to share this, the information that, uh, that was available in this, uh, academic field that hadn't been disseminated. And then what happened is that, uh, the world in general got way more interested in food than it had been. And, uh, the science of cooking was one part of that. So my feeling is that I was very lucky and that I was able to kind of catch the wave early on and then, uh, ride it to the, to the present day. Yeah. I became, you know, fascinated with food as at a young age, cause you know, and growing up in a typical American household, I ate, um, uh, you know, mixed frozen vegetables and, and, you know, tuna helper and, and this, this thing. And, and yet, you know, when I would read about, you know, read history and read, um, about other cultures and other societies, you know, it, it really made me wonder what the heck I was missing out on. And, and even in, in a typical city, you can go down to the Italian market or go down to the Asian market and, and see that there's this, you know, massive world that you're missing out on it. And so I think most people came to that same realization at the time. But in this book, there's, there's not just science, there's, there's in the no, um, nosedive, there, there is uh, a lot of, uh, what, what I might think of as, as humanities or social science in there. Um, and that of course is the part that, that attracted me the most, um, all the compounds and so forth I've already forgotten about, except for the more vivid ones. But, um, but Chuck Pepin in his memoir, he, he, he discussed how in the fifties he wanted to get a PhD in, um, kind of food history. And he couldn't find any place to do it. And, and he ultimately had to kind of create that discipline at, at Columbia university. Um, is there, is there a connection? Do you think, um, are the, are the food science folks and the food, um, uh, history and, and humanities and social significance of, of food folks, uh, and sensory experience talking to each other? 
we are now, but it's true that back in the seventies, uh, I mean, the, the, the base basic problem was that food was not a respectable subject for, for anybody back then. Um, you know, I, I got to know people who were involved in the origins of the Oxford food symposium, which has been going now for, this is its 40th year. So it started in the late 1970s around that, that same time that I had discovered food science as a, uh, an academic discipline, but you know, it, if, if it weren't, uh, yeah, I, uh, I still have trouble understanding why it is that's, that something so fundamental to human existence <laughs> wasn't a respectable academic subject. I, I know many people who proposed thesis projects on, uh, on food in history and sociology and philosophy, uh, and were told by their advisors, no, that's, that's, you can't do that. Now it's very different. Now there are food studies programs all over the place and, uh, all kinds of exciting work being done. So I think, I think there just had to be this kind of, uh, shift in attitude, uh, in the academy that then helped make um, the, the study of food, not only fun and fascinating, but respectable. <laughs> and, uh, I interviewed Richard Rangham recently and he, he discussed how, you know, the, um, change in diet that was enabled by the invention of fire was really fundamental to human evolution. Uh, and so even, even the, um, uh, the paleontologists and the biologists and the, um, uh, anthropologists are, are taking food seriously now as, as you would expect. But again, one of the questions I have for you is, um, does the study of the science, how does this, how does this, does this help or, or hurt one's aesthetic experience? You know, I always wonder, um, and, and you, you know, you, you cite a couple poets like Hugh McDermott, uh, you, you didn't mention Emily Dickinson, but, but you know, others, uh, the poets would, would say all those poets that you studied when you're at Yale, you know, th they would say you're, you know, you, you're dissecting the bird and, and, and killing the song, right? Do, do we really need to know about all these, these, these chemical compounds? I mean, when we're sitting there eating our grouse, you know, at, at, uh, at, at the restaurant, you know, at Fergus Henderson's restaurant, how does knowledge of the science enhance or, or flatten our aesthetic experience? Well, uh, I mean, it's true that uh, Keats, who is the guy I wrote my dissertation on, has a, a line about, uh, how Newton unwove the rainbow, you know, by explaining what was going on, he, he dis essentially destroyed it. Um, uh, and I don't think that's the case. And I actually don't think that Keats thought that because, you know, Keats was a, actually a medical student and appreciated what science could, uh, could bring to human experience. It just seems to me that it, it adds a dimension. It adds a layer of, um, appreciation. So you don't, uh, when I eat something, uh, even knowing the compounds, it's not the compounds that, that, um, uh, that I first encounter. It's my experience. It's the, the taste and the smell and so on. And if it's interesting enough, uh, it's, I've always wanted them to understand more about it. You know, why, why does this thing have this wonderful flavor? Why did the grouse have that effect on me? Uh, and so learning about what underlies that experience, it seems to me, if you're, if you're drawn to the experience in the first place. Uh, just adds a, a dimension of appreciation that you wouldn't have otherwise. So, you know, if you're, if you're on a romantic date and, and you, you know, you're, you're, you're analyzing all of the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the sense and the, and the, you know, the serotonin and the oxytocin and all that, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not going to, um, reduce the romantic nature of the date. Oh, if, if I'm on a date and in fact, I finished the book with a, a description of my second grouse experience, which was with, uh, a very good friend, <laughs> uh, and it wasn't on my mind. The, the, the details were not on my mind at all. You know, it's, it, it, it's just that if you, uh, if you're interested and that's why I call the book a field guide, you know, if, if you're out and you observe a bird, you hear its song, uh, and that's a wonderful experience in and of itself. But if you want to know which bird it was and how far it flew in order to be with you, 
and uh, that kind of thing, then there's that information out there in field guides to, uh, to help you appreciate that. So that the next time you encounter that bird, that's, that's kind of part of your database of, uh, of appreciation. Now this, this book is about what you call the osmocosm. Uh, I teach a class, um, or run a class on the wine industry here at Berkeley. And usually the first, um, session is devoted to, you know, the, the art of wine tasting. So, you know, usually we'll bring someone in and, and they will, um, you know, teach people how to, how to swirl and how to, how to taste. And, and then, you know, usually there's something called like a, a flavor wheel or, you know, a flavor palette. Uh, and then people are, uh, trained to, to identify, you know, this tastes like cat urine or, you know, this tastes like you know, leather or, or mahogany or whatever. And, and they, they have this. And, and so this is something that's very, seems to be very common in, in, in the wine world, but, but we don't tend to see it in other parts of our, our lives, even other parts of our culinary lives. Um, and you know, this book isn't just about food. It's about pretty much, you know, all the different smells, including the smells of the universe, which I guess takes you back to your, your Caltech days. Um, why is it that we don't have like, um, we, we don't talk in those terms. I mean, as a visual artist, you have cerulean blue and you have, uh, you know, uh, cadmium red and, and most painters when they're talking to each other will, will, will use that terminology. And even ordinary people have like, you know, Roy G. Biv and we have the, the, you know, the color spectrum. Why, why is, why is, why is the smell, uh, palette so kind of backgrounded? Why isn't it foregrounded and, and talked about more explicitly? Uh, it's a very good question, and I don't don't have a uh, an answer that I'm uh, you know convinced of particularly, except for the fact that if you just uh, think culturally about the place of smell, um, it's generally been ignored for in the West anyway for thousands of years. You know, beginning with uh, Plato and Aristotle, and going right through to Kant and, and beyond, you know, smell is a very, uh, basic sense. Um, and some would say it's our, our most, uh, animalistic sense and the way that we, um, you know, express our, our humanity most fully is by way of language and, uh, the visual arts and music and, um, that kind of thing, not not sensory experience in and of itself. And, uh, the sense of smell, as I describe in the book is really our most direct contact with the material world. It's, uh, you know, we're not, we're not seeing photons. We're not, we're not, uh, registering pressure waves in the air. We're actually detecting little bits, little molecules of the material world all around us. And it may be that it's, it's that very, um, uh, materialistic aspect of the sense that has led to our really devaluing it, um, over the course of, um, uh, the centuries in, in Western culture in the East, it's, it's not quite so clear cut. Uh, smell has always been important in China and India and uh, Japan and cultures in, in Asia in general, um, in incense, in fragrances in in, um, the celebrations of things in everyday life. I'm not sure that the, the vocabulary for talking about it is, uh, that much more developed in the East than it is in the West. Um, but again, I think we're just as we uh, kind of caught on to the fact that food is really important and interesting and delightful. I think we're now catching on to the fact that, um, uh, sometimes by its absence, uh, by, by our loss of smell in, in the case of COVID, that smell is something that contributes a lot to human happiness and to human understanding. And, um, uh, it's about time that we started to pay more attention to it. Well, I think I read recently that of all the senses, it's the loss of smell, which leads to the greatest rate of, of depression and suicide. Um, so people go blind or deaf, they, they are less likely to kill themselves than if they, if they lose their, their sense of, of smell. And I think, uh, you know, COVID has brought that to people's uh, attention. Um, and so I think you mentioned two things. One is whether 
the idea of smell is something that's, that's explicit and analyzed. And then the other is, um, you know, what it is we smell. So, uh, at least in, in, in the West, we, we, we still have quite a bit of attention to smell, but it seems to be that we want to distance ourselves from those smells, which remind us of our, of our animality, right. Uh, and of our, of our, of our mortality or, or something like this. Um, you know, why, why do you suppose, why do you, why do you, is that, is that the story? Is, is it really that, that, you know, humans are afraid of their, their animal nature and, and, the, and they would just want to camouflage it with, uh, uh, with non-animal sense. I mean, I think in the world of perfume, haven't we seen an evolution away from the, the musks and the civets and more towards like the florals and the, and the, uh, the non-animal smells? Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I think there, there's a lot going on in this, um, in this evolution, uh, that has to do in part with the fact that, you know, we're, we're living in more crowded conditions than we did way, way back. Um, and so we're in contact with each other, uh, more intimately, more often. And, uh, we're generally speaking, shut up indoors. You know, we don't really spend that much of our lives outdoors where the, the air is fresh. So we have to create this, um, this illusion of freshness indoors. And that has led to, you know, the, the, uh, dominance of citrusy, piney, uh, kinds of smells, uh, becoming the, the sort of smell cliches for nice, uh, indoors. Um, and we, we, uh, we are reluctant to impose our personal smells on other people or to have other people's personal smells imposed on us because there's, there's no escaping them if they're there. <laughs> uh, so I think that's, that's a big part of it. You know, our, the, the circumstances in which we live have changed over the centuries and that has led to this kind of deodorization of our uh of our daily lives yeah i think you you reference uh sartre where he, he uh analogized uh smelling someone to uh basically ingesting their body or their vaporized vaporized body um and it's a very it's very um it's a very intimate thing to to sort of smell someone or to be smelled by someone yeah, and I, I think that helps explain why we instinctively, uh, probably biologically, uh, stop breathing in through our nose when we smell something we don't like, because you know we 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 know that it's now inside us. We brought it inside us, and we don't want it in there. So we we shut off that and that avenue of reminding us the fact that we're breathing that same air. But in, in the book, you also talk about kind of. You, know, you ask the question of, well, why? Why is it that we have such sensitive uh, noses? Why is it that we smell? And point out that nothing in itself has smell, right? Smell is a phenomenon of the brain, and and so, you know, if we smell something, presumably there is some survival benefit to 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 smelling that thing. And and there's plenty of things that don't have a smell, and presumably they're you know they're, they're not things like background oxygen, nitrogen, and so forth don't really have a smell. Um, because we don't really need to know what the, you know, the oxygen gradient is because it's more or less everywhere. Um, and it, to, how does understanding kind of the purpose of, our, or, you know, the evolutionary purpose of our, our, our smell sensation, uh, help us to, to appreciate these smells better? Well, uh, I, I think the, the general point would be that, um, uh, smell is a chemical sense, you know, it, it tells us what molecules are in our neighborhood. And, uh, that's been important to life from the very beginnings of life. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the first, uh, single cells needed to know what direction they needed to float in and in or, or propel themselves in to, to get food or to avoid toxins. Um, so it's, it's just absolutely fundamental to, to life. And, uh, you know, in, in mammals, we, we now have a, uh, a sense that has been developed, uh, for us in particular with our noses up off the ground, um, uh, a, a sense that has developed to, to answer the needs of, uh, our particular, 
um, biological and ecological situation. Um, and it, it does seem to be the case that we, because smell has been kind of receding in importance in our daily lives, uh, our, um, apparatus for detecting those smells has been, um, uh, atrophying to some extent. We don't have as many smell receptors as, uh, as many, uh, of our mammalian, uh, relatives do. On the other hand, we have amazing processing power for dealing with the smells that we do detect and, and making sense of them and so on. And so, uh, the, the, sh the, the, uh, I, I think the, the locus of, um, uh, ability in smelling has shifted in us from the detectors to the, the processing, uh, equipment that we have to, to make sense of those smells that we can detect. So there's, there's this long-term evolutionary trajectory where presumably we're, we're less, our smell capabilities are, are not quite as good as say a, a dog's, um, or, you know, some other mammals, but, um, but then there's probably the more, more recent non-biological, uh, change that you reference. And, and the way I think about it is, um, you know, those, those London cab drivers who, who had, you know, the, the hippocampus that was, you know, swollen and they could you know, navigate London. And now with Google maps, that, that hippocampus is just kind of shriveling up. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, you read these stories about the Australian, um, native people who, who can, you know, basically go from one part of Australia to the other, cause they have this visual map. Um, you know, smells not that we don't really need it to survive. Right. I mean, in, in our lives, uh, whereas it might've been much, much more important for, for people in other societies. Does that mean we just don't like the, the, the vocabulary that we have and, and kind of the, the, the smell map is just kind of non-existent or, you know, lessened or flattened, uh, and that it could be built up through, through cultivation or through exposure. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly it. Uh, we, we still have 400 receptors. Uh, and they still do pick up on what's around us. Uh, and what matters is, you know, what use we make of that information. And if we don't, if we don't use it, if we don't pay attention to it, then, uh, there's no reason to, in, in, uh, you know, the next time that we encounter that smell, but if we do stop and register it and think about it, um, uh, and make associations, then yeah, a, a, a lot is possible. A couple of things. One is that, um, uh, in recent years, as smell has become a, um, uh, respectable academic subject, which again, it, like food, it was not for a long, long time that changed around the year 2000. Um, and now it's, it's a hugely exciting field. Now that it's an exciting field, people are going back and looking at questions like, are we better or worse than, than other mammals? And if you, if you actually do the controlled, ex proper controlled experiments, what you find is that we're actually pretty good compared to dogs and, and, uh, wild animals of various kinds when it comes to, um, detecting particular molecules at at low concentrations, you know, we're, we're about as sensitive as, as most mammals are. Um, but because for most mammals, it's a way more important and much more exercised sense, um, that that's where the, the difference lies. So uh, if we, if we started out life, um, paying as much attention to those smells as, uh, as animals do, uh, we would be probably as good. And if we stuck our nose down on the ground the way dogs do, and this has been demonstrated in a wonderful experiment at Berkeley, actually, we can also track things um, as well as dogs do. So uh, l there's a lot of possibility there. That's that's fascinating. Um, you talk about kind of um, you know familiarity and in, you know with smell. The minute when you're exposed to something uh, for more than a few seconds, you kind of stop smelling it. Right. And so you have to kind of refresh yourself. I, I remember, you know, 25 years ago, uh, we were surrounded by cigarette smoke pretty much everywhere. And so you barely noticed it. Now, I think if, if someone lights a cigarette 
300 yards from my house, I, I can, I can smell it almost, almost immediately because it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's something that you don't smell that often, uh, nowadays. I mean, in Ber Berkeley, the marijuana, I don't notice, but, um, you know, um, but does that mean that, that, so you could, you could do like a, uh, you could go to a smell, like a personal trainer for, for, for smelling. In fact, I think you, you, Bruno Latour, you, you reference, he, he wrote about how people in the perfume business can essentially become uh, noses. And, and I like this, this quote that you had from, uh, Michelle, uh, Sears, this was, um, intellect is empty if the body has not knocked about. So is it, is this, is, can we, can we see a day where, you know, you go to smell training institutes, um, the way you currently now go to bodybuilding institutes or something like that? Yes, that's exactly what, uh, people in the perfume industry and, and nowadays in the flavor industry do, um, you know, manufactured, uh, packaged foods are very carefully formulated. Uh, flavor is, is one of the more difficult things that they have to, uh, figure out for materials like that. And, uh, and so flavor chemists and fragrance chemists do exactly that. They, they spend hours every day sniffing individual mole molecules and, uh, noticing the, the, uh, qualities that those molecules evoke in their apparatus. Uh, and because we all have different apparatuses, it's going to be different for different people, but you come up with your own way of recognizing and identifying and associating particular volatile molecules with particular qualities. And, um, yeah, so it's that, that's exactly what goes on in those professions. And nowadays that's actually being applied to people who have lost their sense of smell through COVID and before COVID came, uh, it's, it has been a problem in other kinds of viral infections in, in, uh, as a side effect of chemotherapy and that kind of thing. So you can, you can just make a conscious effort to sit down with, if not individual molecules, then, you know, the, the spices on your spice rack and just sit down and, um, and learn from scratch if necessary, uh, what those particular smells are. So why isn't it used more in say medicine or, uh, you know, I think in the old days, uh, I remember the, uh, the play about, um, George the third, where every day they would inspect his chamber pot, you know, to diagnose his, his illnesses. And I think in, in, you know, in folk medicine, uh, they're, they're constantly evaluating people, uh, based on, on their smell. I know that if I'm sick or if anyone I know is sick, um, I can, I can tell, you know, even before they feel their symptoms, I can usually tell based on their smell. Um, and you know, there's, there's evidence that dogs can do a better job of detecting COVID than, you know, some of the the, the antigen tests that we have out in, in the market. Um, and yet you don't really see at a hospital, you don't have the doc, the dog sniffing for lung cancer. You need to have some kind of, uh, machine, uh, or, or some kind of, you know, blood test. Um, but you know, we use the, we use the, we use the dogs to sniff out the, the, the bombs and we use them to sniff out the, 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 you know, the, the drugs that people are smuggling into, or my case, it's usually the meat that I'm trying to smuggle in from Italy or France and they take it away. They even Same took here. I had an <laughs> apple from Kazakhstan that was accidentally in my bag and they, they took that and I was, you know, basically in trouble with the, with those people for years. Um, but why is it that we don't, I mean, why aren't doctors taught, you know, to, to use their, their, their noses? Is it again, this kind of, you know, aversion to the sense or is it that, um, we just, we would rather use a smelling machine and we just haven't figured out how to do a smelling. We can, we have MRIs, we have CAT scans, we have all these other things, but we don't have a, um, a device that can analyze, you know, volatile, uh, compounds, uh, accurately enough. Yeah. Well, it, actually this is a, another one of those areas that was moribund for a long time and now is very active. So. Um, first of all, uh, doctors have for some time been using particular smells as diagnostics for, uh, especially metabolic diseases, because, uh, you know, if you, if you're lacking genes to deal with particular compounds in your diet, then you end up with byproducts that can be volatile. And that's been a way of, uh, diagnosing a number of serious diseases in, in infants and being able to modify the diet quickly to, to deal with that. 
Um, more generally speaking, uh, the people at the Monell Chemical Senses Center in Philadelphia have been working on um, uh, dog identification of uh, volatiles associated with particular diseases for a couple of decades now. And um, it, it's working for some things. And then the, you know, the machine people are using that information to try to develop uh, sensors that will pick up particular molecules that would be um, useful to know about. So, so it's, it, it's all happening um, uh, at different levels and at different stages. But it hasn't matured yet. You know, it's it's not yet become part of the standard treatment. Now, I want to get back to this idea of kind of, you know, nature versus culture. Um, you know, if, if we think that the sense of smell evolved in order to provide us with you know, valuable information about, you know, attractants and, and avoidance and so forth, then we would think that there's like these, you know, like Darwin talked about the universal emotions. There should be these kind of universal smells that, that nobody likes. Um, there were a couple, a uh, couple compounds that you had cadaverine and put puterine. I love the names of these things, you know, and, and, and so, you know, you would think, well, okay, cadaverine is something that nobody likes, but then you, you, hi you point out, well, actually, you know, in, in some cultures, like that's like, yeah, that's, that's dinner, right? You know, you got the rotting corpse somewhere. So, so how much of, of how much of, how much of our, you know, uh, smell, affect is, is kind of universal and, and natural. Um, you know, and if it is, then, then why, why do, you know, why do we ignore it? So one of the great, a couple of examples you'd point to are how, you know, when, when babies drink breast milk, their, their, their feces, you know, smell fresh. And when they have formula, it smells, you know, rancid. I've heard from people who work in, in, um, uh, meat processing plants that when you slaughter a, a grass fed cow, the, the, there's the, the, the the cow smells, you know, doesn't smell bad, but when you process a, um, a grain fed cow, you know, it, it smells terrible. Um, you know, should, should this, shouldn't this tell us something like, isn't this an indicator of, uh, or is this just, uh, you know, a, a fabricated affect? Well, uh, so, uh, there is, there is, as you say, the, the initial, um, information that we get from our receptors, which is that there are particular molecules in the stuff that we're dealing with. Uh, and so grass fed and grain fed, uh, animals are going, are going to have different body smells because they've been on very different diets, but then, um, how our minds, how our brains register that difference, uh, is going to depend very much on our, um, experience on our database, because what the brain does is take in that chemical information and then, um, uh, use its database to figure out where have I come upon this before? What does it signify and what's an appropriate response to, uh, to that signification. And, uh, and of course, uh, most of that is going to depend on prior experience. That's how your database is built. And it turns out that, you know, we, uh, all human beings appear to go through a period in, uh, you know, late infancy, early childhood, where, um, the, the slate is clean, you know, they'll, they'll put anything in their mouths. And, uh, so disgust and displeasure seems to be learned. Uh, there don't seem to be any universal, uh, compounds or univer universal responses to particular compounds. But I should also say that, you know, the, the response is going to depend on the dose. So even very pleasant things, if you're hit with an awful lot of it all at once, is just going to be uh, overwhelming and therefore unpleasant for that reason. And that's why I think there is this kind of gradation for things like um, putrescine and uh, scatol and indole, which are molecules that in decaying animal flesh are really prominent and overwhelming, but they're also in flowers in tiny little doses in the background where in fact, they, they kind of lend a, a, an interest because they're not your usual flowery smell, but they're also not so obvious as to really disgust you. Uh, so it's, it's complicated. So it's, it's the compounds themselves, their concentrations. 
our experience, our expectations. Um, it's, it's a wonderfully complicated mixture. Yeah. I mean, so many of the foods that we eat are, um, are, you know, basically rotting, uh, in one way or another. Uh, I mean, some are worse than, I mean, a poisse you mentioned is my favorite cheese of, of, of all, of all time. And, um, you know, it does, does smell, you know, rather human-like in a way. And, and, um, and, you know, what is it? Lutefisk or the one I heard was the absolute worst was a uh, Greenland shark, which, uh, I don't think you mentioned it in the book, but, but it's, you know, they bury it for, for months and it's just, you know, awful apparently, but it, it, it's also apparently really good. If you, uh, if you get used to it, drink it with a strong aqua beat. Yes. Uh, no, uh, Hakarl, I think is the name of that, uh, that shark. And it's true. I, I have not tasted that, although I, I did include the fact that it's apparently it smells mostly like ammonia when, when all the, the fermentation is, is done. Uh, my, my favorite, uh, extreme food is something called surstroming, which is, a uh, a canned, uh, Swedish herring that is essentially allowed to rot, uh, in the can. So, you know, in, in the U S anyway, um, if we buy canned goods and the, and the can begins to swell, that's a sign of the possibility of botulism. Yeah. And so you're, you're supposed to just get rid of it without even opening it. In the case of surstroming, what you're looking for are cans that look more like footballs than like cans, because that, that in can fermentation is a big part of the, of the ultimate appeal, but you have to open it very carefully because it's under pressure and you don't want to get sprayed. Yeah. You talk about, uh, you brought a Dorian fruit into your hotel room in, in, in Singapore and that, that didn't, that didn't end well. That's right. That's right. Uh, I, and I, I was fascinated by it, uh, sitting out, uh, street side and enjoying my different durian, uh, cultivars. But when you bring it into an enclosed space, like your hotel room, uh, which you aren't supposed to do anyway, um, it quickly builds up to really, uh, yeah, uh, unlivable <laughs> levels. So, you know, when you live in these micro, uh, worlds, like I do in, in Berkeley or, you know, people in, in New York's Brooklyn or whatever, um, it's, it's almost impossible to know what the general trends are in the world. Um, and so in, in this world, you know, you see an increasing interest in those, you know, funky, uh, uh, malodorous, uh, foods and fermented stuff. I mean, people joke about how everybody in Brooklyn's becoming a, you know, a pickle maker, uh, or whatever, but you know, the, the more, the broader trend seems to be kind of worldwide, a movement away from, um, from these, these sorts of foods. Uh, and, um, in particular, you talk, well, I found fascinating this term, uh, like, uh, pre pre cooking on the hoof, right. Where, whether it's castration or, or, or grass, uh, feeding, um, or, uh, I forget, there was another, um, thing that, 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 that you could do to, to an animal, uh, to, um, basically make it, um, taste less like uh, like, yeah, make it fattier. So the foie gras process, right. These are all ways of essentially getting rid of the, the animal like flavor. Um, you know, is, 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 is that a, is that a, what's driving that trend? And, and is that sort of just consistent with this idea that people are versed to being reminded that they're eating animals and, and they want to believe that they're, they're just eating this, this disembodied protein. Is that the idea? <laughs> Uh, good question. I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I think and the people who are making the fake meat. Should they, you know, here in Bay area, everybody's making fake meat. Should, should they think about like putting a, a more stinky and goaty smell into it to make it more, more, more meat like, well, it, you know, that's one of the things is that, uh, it, people have different preferences for, uh, especially those kinds of things, you know, they're, they're they really do kind of divide populations, uh, people who, who love those kinds of strong animal flavors and other people who, uh, who are, just can't stand them. I, I think in the case of things like, uh, foie gras, you know, that's, that has, uh, I think as much to do with just the sense of luxury. It's, it's something that, um, takes a lot of effort. 
to, to produce. It takes a long time to produce. It's a seasonal thing, at least in its original form. And so it was kind of a special food for, for those reasons. And I think the people who invented it, you know, who were in the Middle East and, uh, and Europe probably had no problem with, with very animal <laughs> flavors, but it may be part of the reason that people here now like it, um, that that's, that's quite possible. Um, the, the flavor of foie gras is much less livery than just plain liver is. Uh, the other thing I found, found interesting is, um, that, um, the, what you eat affects how you smell. And, um, and I, and I think I forget which nation, which, which culture it was that, that their word for Europeans is, you know, the people who smell like butter, um, you know, but, but, uh, you mentioned how, um, you know, Africans and Asians and, and, and Europeans have different smells in part because of their, their biology, but also in part because of what you eat. And so the, uh, the, 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 I remember you, you described how, um, some people, uh, would refer to, you know, Europeans as, uh, that in China, they would say that they smell like, smell like goats. They're like the goat people, uh, or, or they smell like Russians or, you know, this is a term that means, you know, people who, who have this more, you know, meaty, meaty smell. <laughs> hey, um, is how much of, how much of, how much of that is, is, uh, is, is driven by what you eat? How is what you eat change what you smell and how, how you smell? Well, uh, so there, there are these two different, uh, aspects. One is the, the, um, uh, intrinsic body odor of humans, <laughs> regardless of what their diet is. And it turns out that that does vary from, uh, from one part of the world to another, and it has to do with genetics. Uh, and this has been nailed down by, uh, people in the flavor and fragrance business because they want to find out, you know, how to formulate their deodorants to make them most effective. So they need to understand what it is that they're trying to, uh, deodorize. And what they found, um, and now biologists are very interested in this, is uh, genetic variance between Asian populations, European populations, um, North American populations, South American, African. Uh, we've all got different sets of genes that encode compounds that ultimately affect the way we smell. And uh, it, it's fascinating. No one's come up with a, a good explanation yet for why they should be so different. Um, but that's one thing. Uh, then there are the smells that develop in and on us, uh, based on our diet. And, uh, those develop simply because when we take food in, our body metabolizes the, the materials that come into us. It makes use of the things that it can make use of like proteins and carbohydrates and fats. The other stuff, it has to find a way to uh, to get rid of so that it doesn't gum up our works. You know, we're, uh, if the compounds can't be used, then we need to dispose of them and either they're disposed of directly, uh, as is. And so if you've eaten, um, Indian food recently, and it happens to have fenugreek as one of the components of the spice mix, you're going to sweat that out and you're going to pee it out and, uh, uh, so you'll know it for a while. Um, and in fact, my, my grandmother is, uh, was, uh, Indian and, uh, lived in England. I would see her once a year, basically, and just sitting in her lap. That's what I remember. That was, that was what she smelled like all the time. In addition to the warmth and the, all the other things. Um, so, so it's a combination of those two things. It's, it's what it is that we take into our bodies and that our bodies need to deal with. And then the, uh, the intrinsic compounds that our bodies make apparently, uh, originally to, uh, as, as signals to each other. Yeah. One of the more interesting chapters in the book was really about kind of animal signals. Uh, and it's an area that I'm, I'm very interested in. Um, and you know, you walk through how, um, you know, these, these compounds that, that animals create, I mean, they, they go to a lot of effort. They go to a lot of, uh, I mean, just like flowers, but animals, they, they put a lot of effort into creating these, these, uh, these chemicals that are, um, may serve no other purpose than to, uh, generate and, and collect, uh, smells. 
uh, in conjunction with the, the bacteria that, that they're, you know, they're basically feeding, they're basically feeding this, this biome, which has certain smell and it's, it's meant to signal certain things. Um, and, uh, and a lot of it is about, you know, dominance or, or, you know, uh, other things, or it's not that they're, you're trying to communicate fear, but then people are able to detect it, uh, and other things. Um, and I'm wondering, um, you know, does this it's kind of body odor suppression is body odor suppression kind of a, um, a corollary to democracy? Like, do we need to have body odor suppression in order to suppress all these, these signals that are, that are, I mean, if, if, if the signals about, you know, you're, you're on the in group versus the out group, you're my neighbor. I need to distinguish you from, from, you know, the people one village over, um, or, you know, you, you're, you're dominant and you're submissive. Like, do we need to just suppress all this? Uh, and, and I'm wondering, you know, there's these studies that show, um, every time you shake someone's hand, you know, like you, you, you smell their hand, presumably to feel them out and figure out, you know, how they, how they relate to you. Maybe with, with COVID and all the elbow bumping, you know, we don't have this information and that, that might be a good thing. Maybe it's better that we're all kind of, you know, the same. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'd actually never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> that aspect of this. Um, I, I don't think that, um, well, first of all, uh, uh, um, psychologists, uh, and biologists are very interested in, in this question of, uh, chemical communication and pheromones and this kind of thing, and whether these sorts of effects exist in human beings. Um, and it's still very much up in the air. It's a, a very elusive, uh, thing. It's not, you know, a kind of in your face effect. Um, a lot of it seems to be subliminal, you know, so you, you can't, uh, you don't meet someone and smell your hand and immediately think oh, this guy's going to be trouble or something like that. Um, it's, uh, if there's processing going on, it's going on below the level of consciousness. And it does seem that, that people are able to, um, uh, detect, um, uh, fear and illness and things like that. Um, if, if they're, you know, in experimental situations and smelling, um, cotton swabs that have been in the armpits of people with these various things, they can tell differences, um, um, but how much of a role that actually plays in our everyday life when we're also looking at people and there's noise and the air is moving and you've got expectations and you're thinking what you're going to say next. Um, I, I, I think it's a fascinating question, um, but still very much up in the air. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we, with all the attention that, that we've, we've been uh, giving to racism and, uh, you know, outgroup discrimination and so forth. Um, and you know, the emphasis is almost entirely on what people look like and if, if people, you know, do smell differently based on their ethnicity, um, uh, you know, there, there could be discrimination happening, but it's happening for reasons that are very, very, um, you know, that we're not really paying attention to. Um, and, uh, so, um, uh, one of the things I want to circle back to is how, how these things combine, because, uh, one of the most fascinating facts, and by the way, there, there are like just an enormous amount of super interesting insights in this book, just like in, on food and cooking, I had to wade through all the chemistry <laughs> to, 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 to get, to get the insights that I, I was looking for. But, um, you know, you mentioned the importance of, of allium or is it allia? Um, and I'm someone who puts garlic, shallots, onions, scallions, you know, ramps, pretty much anything that, that is, is, is an allium. I pretty much have in my, my, uh, pot pretty much every day. Um, and, and you, you may, you made this, this interesting insight that, um, what we think of as, as this good flavor, you know, gravy t tends to come from the, the allia. And one of the reasons why is, is because it activates, uh, kind of, uh, sort of, a, a the same thing that we get from human sweat. This is at least a conjecture. Um, and so a lot of our interaction with food is, is, is driven by, um, things that may come from an entirely different domain, our, our relationship with people and, and vice versa. That's right. Uh, it, 
um, yeah, it's to me, well, you know, I, I should maybe say that the reason I ended up writing this book about the smells of the world is that I started out writing a book just about flavor, about food and drink, and then realized, uh, as I did that, that I was constantly being referred by the, the scientific literature to other things, you know, to molecules that are found in, or are even more dominant in other things in the world that have nothing to do with, with food and drink. And that led me to wonder why it is that these other things in the world have the, the smells that they do. And that's how, uh, a field guide to the world's smells, uh, came about, took me eight years longer than I was supposed to, <laughs> but, uh, but I think it was, it was worth it because, um, it's something that I, that hadn't occurred to me before. And I, I think doesn't occur to most people, which is that whenever we're enjoying food and drink, um, we're of course enjoying those things, but, but, um, those things have a lot in common with other parts of the world and other experiences. And, um, they have the, the flavors they do for reasons, um, evolutionary or culinary or whatever they might be. And, um, uh, getting back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, um, I don't think that that diminishes our appreciation of food and drink. I think it actually adds something to it because we can, it, it's, it's, um, it's a different uh, aspect that we're adding to our database. You know, we have our own personal experiences and our own personal knowledge, but science has told us a lot about these interconnections. And if we put that in our database, then that's, that's just another thing we can enjoy. You talk about how we're, we're able to do like pseudo fermentation. Uh, some of the, some of the more interesting food products that I've consumed over the years were you know, the product of some kind of fermentation, uh, or Know, what what you call um uh two different types of alchemy right you have the pyro alchemy and the what, what's the word used for the fermentation bio bio alchemy <laughs> right so and, yeah. and so a lot of these processes are very time consuming they're very uh carefully orchestrated you know, cult managing these these uh these 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 fungi and managing these these bacteria is very very compl complicated um and you know modern science enables us to kind of short circuit all this. So rather than spending, you know, 20 years making some kind of balsamic vinegar, we can, we can, you know, whip it up in the lab in, in a few, few seconds. Or, um, you know, my favorite is, uh, one of my students was working for a company that is, they can make something that tastes like a uh, barrel aged, uh, whiskey, um, almost instantly because they've distilled down what the, 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 the volatile, compound is and then they just inject it into the the grain alcohol and bingo you have like you know 20 year old whiskey um if what do i would love to know what your thoughts are about this because you know there's this kind of authenticity and story and narrative uh that that shapes our experience um if you if you strip all that away does that does that change things and and i noticed you had um uh daniel patterson was was one of the people you you thanked in, at the end of the book, uh, and he's of course a local chef who orchestrates all these fascinating kind of sensory experiences at the dining table. Um, is is there is there a concern that you know the the, the molecular gastronomy movement and kind of like fabricating stuff in the lab as opposed to the the long kind of craft tradition over the years is is there something that's that's going to be lost there, or is is this sort of just a is that is that a, is that a grumpy crotchety, um, you know, response to, to this. Well, I, I think it's a, a completely understandable response, but it's not exactly my response. Um, it, it, uh, I would go back to the, the, uh, the way it is that we perceive things, the way it is that we take pleasure in things, which has to do with our experience and our, our database and our expectations and so on. And I would just say that, um, you know, a, a concocted whiskey and a true, um, truly made, traditionally made whiskey, uh, they're, they're, uh, similarly flavored products of two very different processes. And, uh, it depends on what you like, you know, uh, I, I'm sure there are people, you know, the, the fans of Soylent, for example, will think it's really cool <laughs> that you can do this. 
and they'll sip on uh, the concocted whiskey and really enjoy it as a, and, and I can kind of do that as a, an indication of an expression of human ingenuity, you know, that we took this really complicated process, figured out how it works, figured out what it is that really makes a difference to us and have recreated it in a, in a completely different way. I think that's an amazing achievement. On the other hand, if you give me the choice between that and a, and a 20 year old, uh, scotch whiskey or a bourbon, I'll take the real thing, the real thing, because I appreciate the fact that this is, this is the product of such a different process. And it's the, the appreciation of the process, um, that I think makes the difference. You know, it's, it, when, when you come right down to it, the particular uh, sensations themselves are just the beginning of the process of appreciating and enjoying something. And so simply replicating those is an achievement, but it's a very different thing from enjoying and imagining how the other thing was made and, and appreciating that. So there, there will always be people who, um, will pay extra for the wind up watch and there will always be people that will pay extra for the, 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 the physical books. <laughs> so I still have, you know, piles of, of physical books, including your books. Um, uh, and I uh, haven't yet, I'm, I'm as technologically advanced as I am, I'm resisting the Kindle. Um, and, uh, so, you know, last question, I guess, is that, um, is this, does this offer the opportunity for a, a new occupation or profession? You know, we think about architects and architects are basically designing our, our space. Um, you know, they, they're starting to think about putting a sense and, and aromas into, we, we know that in, in, uh, and I was talking to, uh, I was interviewing, uh, Charles Spence recently, and he was talking about how, you know, if you want to sell more cookies, you got to have the smell of cookies in the, in, in the, in the environment and so forth. It, uh, will we, we have a new kind of smell architect is this a new occupation uh and will people you know seek out um designed smell experiences will it or will this just sort of you know, or will we continue down this road of 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 you know smell degradation and, and disappearance what do you think no i i think smell is is already enjoying a renaissance um you know i just received uh the other day a uh, a catalog for a museum in Amster, you know, in the, in the Hague in, in the Netherlands, which has an exhibit now, of of paintings and, um, uh, and along with it, they're, uh, providing little spray bottles of smells so that you can experience what it is that you see in these 17th and 18th century paintings of, uh, of life in the Netherlands. Um, so the art world is discovering it as an, an additional aspect of the experience of enjoying, um, uh, the art of the past. And there are now people who do specialize in creating and designing, um, uh, smell spaces, uh, and people are leading tours of cities by virtue of their smells, you know, going to different neighborhoods to appreciate different smells. Uh, so I think we're in the midst of a, uh, a renaissance and I, I don't think smell is going to go away. <laughs> Hopefully we'll breed flowers with smell back into them and so forth. Um, Harold, thank you so much. This is great. Uh, hopefully, um, be able to have you over for dinner sometime in Berkeley. Um, check this out, right? Nosedive. Uh, and of course the classic, um, on food and cooking. Um, I, I, you're going to have another addition to this out sometime, uh, soon or, or what do you think? Maybe sometime, but not soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so don't wait for the next one. Go, go get this one. Uh, and then, um, you know, if, if you, you'll, you'll still get plenty of value out of it while waiting for the next edition. Uh, thank you so much, Harold. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Greg. It was great fun. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 